Before we get there, if you join me now as we study God's Word together, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're really doing an introduction to the rapture of the church. Uh, it happens to be the focal point here of this first letter uh, to the church at Thessalonica, this church that was in uh, Greece that Paul wrote to, and so they had a question, and that question is revealed to us here in chapter 4. And that question is very simple. What happened to our loved ones who have died and gone on to be with the Lord? Are they going to miss the resurrection of the church? And so the answer is here. But Paul answers it in a way that's not mentioned previously uh, in this way in all of Scripture. And so we come to this incredible doctrine, this beautiful promise, this wonderful picture of our security that we have, our blessed hope, of the glorious appearing of our great God and King. Now I want you to take note of several things. Who was involved and where these things take place because one of the problems that many people have is they confuse the rapture of the church with the second coming of the Lord. Uh, that is made very clear in this passage. And so as we look at these verses, though this will be an introduction in light of our time at the table, um, I believe we can uh, easily see what the Lord would have us to see here in his word. And so before we dig into verse 13 here in 1 Thessalonians 4, would you pray with me? Father, uh, we have come gathered as your bride, your church. Lord, expectant that at any moment of any day that trumpet could sound and we who are alive and remain would be caught up to meet you in the air. And so God, we thank you for that promise we thank you for the sacrifice that made it possible that we will celebrate as we come to the table. For without that broken body and without that shed blood of our Savior Jesus, no one would see heaven. But because of it, the only name under heaven whereby men must be saved has been made available to us by grace and through faith. And so, Lord, speak to us through your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 13, now, can I remind you that when Scripture tells you not to be ignorant of something, probably a good idea that you're not ignorant of whatever it is that follows, amen? So notice this, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. So there's your question. You know, what happens to that person that you know, I know, we know, who in the Lord has fallen asleep? It's a metaphor for passing away, dying. You see, they had all kinds of different things that they thought about what happened to the human at, at death. And people still have those same basic understandings today. Do you just cease to exist? Do you, do you maybe go to some place where your soul is asleep? There are a number of cults that teach that very thing to this day. But the Apostle Paul is going to set us straight in this wonderful doctrine that we call uh, the rapture, the harpazo, the snatching away in, in Latin rapturo, uh, that we'll see down there in verse 17. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those that have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Now, for many of you, you've probably been to a memorial service. You've probably been to a funeral. If you haven't, chances are at some point in time, should the Lord tarry, you will. You've been to the funeral of someone who doesn't know the Lord. It is a grievous, sad, horrible time. Because when someone does not know the, know the Lord, they have no hope. They don't have hope, and their family, even if they know the Lord, do not have hope that they will ever see that person again. But for we who love the Lord, we have a reunion coming, amen? We look forward to that glorious appearing, because when the Lord appears in heaven, and we meet him there, Every last person that you have ever known who's received Christ as Savior is going to meet you for that glorious reunion. It's going to be party in heaven. Marriage supper of the Lamb for about seven years. You see, we're going to have a great reunion. And we look forward to that day. But someone who does not know the Lord does not have that assurance, and they are not looking forward to taking their last breath. For those of us who love the Lord, what's the worst that can happen to you today? You die and you go home to be with Jesus, amen? So the worst thing here is the best thing there. 
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, can I tell you that is the irreducible minimum of the gospel? You must believe that Jesus was alive. He is God's own son. He came to this earth. He lived a sinless life. And he died in your place, my place, on Calvary's cross, and then was raised again on the third day. That is the irreducible minimum of the gospel. That's what we believe. And so the Apostle Paul says, look, this is what we believe. This is why we have hope. This is the reason for that hope. Even so, God will bring with him, notice what he's doing. Where's Jesus right now? He's in heaven, amen? So he's coming again. Let's look closely. He will bring with him those who are asleep in Jesus. Those who have believed that irreducible minimum that Jesus died and was risen again, and so thereby we who believe will also be raised. And so if Jesus is in heaven, one day he's going to bring back those who are with him. The Apostle Paul gives us a, a very clear understanding of what that is. There in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So when you exit this planet as a Christian, you take your last breath. The worst day that you could possibly have as a human being comes upon you and you are run over on the freeway. You're going to wake up in glory. Amen? So he's telling us why we have this hope. God's going to bring with them. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain, who do you think that is? That would be you. If you're here today in Christ Jesus, you have believed that Jesus Christ is Lord, you are the we who are alive and remain today. Now, you will remain that until you are no longer here. So it was true for the Thessalonians, it is true for us, and it will continue to be true until the Lord comes for his church. It's the expectant hope the amazing, glorious appearing of our great God and King. So he's telling us what's going on here. He's giving us a picture that was true in the past. It, it was true yesterday. It's true today, and it will be true into the future. That one day, the Lord Jesus is going to bring with him those who have gone before, and we who are alive and remain, notice where this happens. He says, until the coming of the Lord, which he's going to come. Jesus is coming, amen? amen? I love that admonition. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We just sang. Like a bride waiting for a groom. I've done a lot of weddings. And you know what? When, when the bride finally gets to that day, there is a sense of expectancy by everyone gathered at the wedding. The bride and the groom are going to meet. One day you're going to be a part of that, and then we're going to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to meet our bridegroom. We will by no means precede those who are asleep. You see, people often wonder, well, are, are, are those who went before, are they going to miss the resurrection? You know, is there like several levels to heaven? Is there some place where everybody goes? Is there some other plan that God has? We get the answer right here. No, they're not going to precede us. You see, you are three parts as a human being. You are soul. That would include your psyche, your mind, those non-material things. You're also spirit. That's where you commune with God. You meet with the Lord. You meet him in that spirit realm. You are soul. You are spirit. You are also body. The apostle Paul called that body a tent. It's a dwelling place. It's a place for both your soul and your spirit to hang out. And so while you're here on this earth, all three parts are together. But there's going to come a point in time when there's going to be a separation of that material body and the immaterial soul and spirit. The only question then becomes this. Where is that soul and where is that spirit going to spend eternity? Because there are exactly two choices. 
And so he dresses this for us. So the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Here's the reunion. Because one day we're all getting wonderful new bodies. Anybody in here need a new body? I did some gardening yesterday. And, and, and I realized that I am not quite as flexible as I used to be. And so whereas I used to be able to stand up straight, put my palms straight onto the ground from standing up, I now can put my palms on the ground providing I lay on the ground. <laughs> I'm waiting for a new body. I, I am anxiously waiting for a new body. But I'm not going to get that new body until everybody gets their new body. So whether I'm here or whether I'm there, we're all going to come together in heaven and we're all going to get new bodies suited for heaven. Until that time, our spirit will remain alive wherever you choose for it to be. Those two choices we'll get to in a moment. And then we who are alive and remain, here it is, shall be caught up, snatched away by force. The original language there in the Greek, harpazo, translated into Latin, vulgate, rapturo. Caught up, taken away, Notice where it happens. With them in the clouds. Students of the Bible, you're here today, you're Bereans. When the Lord comes again the second time, where's he coming? He's coming here. Prophet Zechariah said that the Lord will one day put his feet down on the Mount of Olives. And it will split in two. So this obviously is not that. The Lord's not coming to earth. He's only coming as far as the reaches of heaven. And he tells us why. We're going to meet him there in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So for those who have a problem discerning which one of these two events there are, or if they happen to believe there's no such thing as the rapture, you have a tough problem with this chapter. Because it clearly says these people are going to be with Jesus, never leave the presence of the Lord, but they will not see him here on this earth until he comes back again a second time. This is the beautiful doctrine of the rapture of the church. And then notice what it says. And therefore, because of this, in light of that truth, comfort one another with these words. What a comfort the rapture of the church is to us. You see, my hope is not in this world. My hope is in heaven. What I long for is not more of what this world can offer, but all that Christ is who is in heaven. And one day, we're all going to meet him. Amen? You see, what they were worrying about was people that had fallen asleep. They, they had taken their last breath. And so they were referring to the sleep of death. And I would remind you that nowhere in Scripture, not ever, is an unbeliever spoken of as asleep. It's always believers. So it's talking about someone who is asleep, exactly as it says in Jesus. You see, when we fall asleep, our bodies remain here on this earth. I always get into these conversations because people will ask me things like, well, you know, my aunt or my uncle or, you know, my mom, my dad want to be cremated. You know, what happens at the resurrection? Look, if you've ever been on an archaeological dig, um, most people who've been in the ground for a while, they kind of don't look like people anymore. Mostly like bones and sometimes not a whole lot of bones. So I'm pretty sure the God that created the universe out of nothing can reassemble you wherever you are including if you got vaporized by a nuke, so just square all that away in your mind. <laughs> he created the atoms that make up the molecules, that make up the proteins and the amino acids and all the stuff that makes up you. He's very capable of resurrecting you from wherever you end up. So he's just telling us when that happens. He's saying, look, I'm going to pull everybody together who loves the Lord, everyone who's died in faith. Can you imagine what kind of reunion that is? You see, the, the world is afraid of falling asleep, and we actually look forward to it. You know, some people believe that your soul can fall asleep, but it's simply not absolutely, according to Scripture, not true. 
Nowhere do we find that your soul disappears. It is merely translated from one place to another. And so your soul is fully awake. The only question is, where is that? And as, as we go to sleep here physically, we're very much still awake. Spiritually. You're going to have understanding. You're going to know. Scripture says you're going to know him as you are known now. You're going to know other believers. And one day, you're going to receive a, a glorious heavenly body. And remember, one of the things that is not taught here in this passage is what happens when Jesus comes back. Because when he comes back a second time, he's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen? He's coming back as the conquering king, the Lord of lords. He will have on his thigh a name that no one knows. He'll come back to fight the battle of Armageddon. He's going to come back and actually punish the world for what it's done with Israel, with the land that belongs to God that was given to the nation Israel, and to sin. He's coming back as a conquering king. The next chapter, chapter 5, we find out that he has not appointed us believers to wrath. And when he comes back in the second coming, it's for the pure purpose of pouring out his wrath on this earth. I do not anticipate being here for that. So if you happen to be one of those people that says, I think I deserve to, you know, have the wrath of God poured out on you, well, whether you do deserve it or not, uh, I would say that I deserve it as well. Praise God for the grace of God. Amen? You will not have the wrath of God poured out in your life. You've been saved from that. When someone asks you, what have you been saved from? Tell them, the wrath of God. It's what you got saved from. You've been saved from the penalty of sin, which is death. Amen? You've been saved from that. Why would God put you through what he has saved you from? And so he says, I won't. I'm going to translate you to one of two destinations. Here's a little thing for you. You, you see, when we leave this earth, your Bible says that we're absent from this body we move out of the tent, and we immediately go to be with the Lord, either one at a time or at the rapture of the church. And here's how that happens. You have to be born a second time. That's why Jesus said, uh, you must be born again. You see, your choice is this. You can be born once, and Scripture says you will die twice. You will die first the physical time, and then at the great white throne judgment, Revelation chapter 20, you will die again a far worse death. That one will be eternal. Here's the other choice. You can be born that second time into new life, and you're only going to die once, and you will live eternally forever with the Lord. So it's really just a matter of where. You're going to live somewhere eternally. The rapture of the church is to remind us we have to choose before he comes which destination we want. To believe on his name is to be saved. So you can choose. Two births, your destination is heaven. One birth, your destination will be judgment. As we begin to think about the communion table which is in front of us, you see, when you make that decision, then all of a sudden that hope comes upon you. You see, my hope is in the life that is after the one that we're currently living. So when someone dies and they love the Lord, I have hopeful sorrow. I'm going to see him again. Pastor Chuck used to always remind us, you know, if there's a newspaper article that says he's died, don't believe it. He just moved. That's the deal. He moved. He's in that destination that is for all of us. He's with the Lord. I'm going to see him again. I'm sure he's up there with Jesus right now doing something. So is Pastor Steve. They're wandering around probably trying to tell Jesus how to fix something in heaven. <laughs> well, you see, we have expectant hope. I can't wait. I don't know if you guys ever do it. I go out, sometimes I look up at the sky, it's like rapture drill. <laughs> it's 
checking to see if you're up there, Lord. So many people put their hope and trust in their bank account. They put their hope and their trust in their homes and their cars and their position in some business entity. God forbid you put your hope and your trust in our government. Amen? You know some people that got disappointed. Yeah. Washington offers no permanent peace. Only the Prince of Peace offers that. You want permanent peace? Your mind is at perfect peace who has stayed in Him. That's how you have peace. It's by receiving the promise. I'm going to have the worship team come back out. You see, when we think about all that is contained in this passage, and again, we'll finish this up after Easter, next Sunday, Palm Sunday. But now as we tie it into the communion table, which is before you, notice the big if that is here in verse 14. And the word if here is not a, it's not a question. It's not as, as though there's something that, that is at question here. It is a supposition. The if is focused on, it's assumed to be true, it is the object of, it really says because I'm saved. If, meaning that because we are God's kids. Because we are saved. Because Christ did die. Because He is raised and lives forevermore. Because of the cross of Christ which has freed me from the debt that I owed. Because of it. That great if. The cross, Jesus took my sin and your sin. He took my garbage and gave you His gold. Gave me His gold. He took my unrighteousness and gave me His righteousness. You're going to receive first the bread. And I would ask that you simply hang on to the bread and then we'll pass out the cup. And please hold both elements and then we'll partake together. But you see, as we're here today, the assumption is, is that you believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and are one of His kids. And that's why you have the hope of the rapture of the church. Matter of fact, Peter, when he preached that incredible sermon there in Acts, Acts 2, he actually made this point. He said to those Jewish people listening, and 3,000 of them got saved that day, he said, look, you, you deliver Jesus into lawless hands, and you put him to death, but God raised him up. That's what you're celebrating with this. This is the broken body of Christ our Savior. He did for you what you couldn't do for yourself. Our physical bodies, because Christ was raised one day, our physical bodies also going to be raised. Because His Spirit is in the presence of, God, presence of God, so will your spirit be in the presence of God forevermore. It's a done deal. Sealed at the cross. When Jesus said to tell us die, it's finished. He meant exactly that. The only thing you need to do is believe on the only begotten Son of God and you'll be saved. And because of that, we have hope. We can have joy. So as the worship team leads us in worship, I would ask that you remain in an attitude of prayer and reflection thankful before the Lord for what He's done on the cross because of His body that was broken, His blood that was shed, one day that trumpet's going to sound, family. And we who are alive and remain are going to meet Him in the air. And what you hold in your hand is the guarantee of that. It's how Jesus said, remember me. Remember what I did 